and um, just want to introduce Ricky Ott, an oil toxicologist who uh, happened to be in uh, Cordova, Alaska when the Exxon Valdez oil spill occurred. And uh, Ricky has lots of um, experience with other oil spills and tankers and other related things that uh, she will share with us tonight. Thank you. That are relevant to your yeah. future. Um, okay, so first of all, I'm going to send these jars back. Um, and you can keep this one on this side, this one on that side, but open them up. These were collected on a beach in Prince William Sound 20 years right. after the Exxon Valley soil spill. And this is a clean beach. All right? How about this one right here? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty good. So, what I'm uh, going to try to do here is spend half my time talking about sharing stories um, from Alaska from the Gulf of Mexico. I was there for a full year after the BP disaster. Thank you. And then Michigan with the Enbridge pipeline spill. I'm on weekly teleconferences now with the people there. So I'm going to kind of weave all those stories. That's sort of the, the crisis um, that we're trying to prevent from happening um, anywhere. Actually, anywhere. Um, and then the flip side of that is the opportunity. Anytime there's a crisis, there's also an opportunity. In this case, it's an opportunity to organize. Right? And so I'm going to share what other people are doing and what can be done um, um, in communities that face these crises. So this is, um, yeah, I grew up in Wisconsin in the late 1960s. And I was the oldest of three children. And when I was 12 years old, and, or 13, walking to middle school, um, the birds were literally falling out of the trees, dying. And these were robins. And even a little kid knows something is terribly wrong when that happens. So I went to my father and I said, why? And he, he put a dying robin in my hand, actually, and he explained about the neurotoxin DDT. Um, and the way uh, my dad works is he doesn't just say, here's the problem. He then went on, educated his friends about the problem, raised money and sued the state of Wisconsin over the use of DDT. Wisconsin was the first state to ban DDT, the rest of the nation followed suit. And so for, from my worldview, what I saw my father do is he was afraid for us, for his three kids, he didn't want us out breathing this air that was killing birds. So in my mind I put it together pretty quickly that if it's bad for the wildlife, it's bad for the people, it's bad, we gotta do something. Um, so, uh, I fell in love with Rachel Carson's writing. She was a marine biologist, Silent Spring, about the DDT and everything. And I decided I was going to become a marine biologist. And that's really hard. Um, Wisconsin is landlocked. So I, I, I took off. So East Coast, West Coast, and eventually got a master's and a doctorate in marine toxicology, oil pollution. And then thought I would take one summer off before I started a career, and I wound up in Cordova. This is Cordova, Alaska, and that's where I've been for 26 years now. Um, and it's a fishing town. Um, it's tourism, uh, more so now. Um, but I commercial fished for nine years, from 1985 through the Exxon Valdez oil spill until the fisheries collapsed in 1993. And I'm going to talk more about that. And that's when I realized, geez, this is just like what I learned about, right? Long-term effects of this. It's time to, to it's time to retire from fishing and start doing this. Um, so my life completely changed March 24th, 1989, when I woke up to a knock on my door that we've had the big one. It was the fisherman coming to get me, um, and I flew over the wreck of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Little tiny tanker, great big oil slick, and I remember thinking, I know enough to make a difference. Do I care enough? And I think that's kind of where we're all at now, whatever community you live in. You, we really know enough to make a difference. Do we care? Um, and I decided yes. I thought that the science, putting my science out there, would be what would help, because the laws are supposed to be based on the science. And what I found was that doesn't work at all. I made a commitment that we would, I would work to help transition um, the United States off of oil in my lifetime. As long as we drill, we'll spill. So that was my commitment, and I realized about 15 or so years in that it was going to take more than science. It was going to take a social movement. 
And so now I'm community organizer, <laughs> um, as well as a scientist. Um, a year, well actually, 21 years after the Exxon Valdez oil spill was the BP blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. And I um, went down, well I wasn't gonna go, because it brought up all the trauma again. And I spent about a week dodging all the media. And then I thought, oh man, all those communities are gonna make the same mistakes we made, um, because they're gonna have all these lies and they won't know what's the lie, what's the truth, unless somebody coaches them. And then I realized, oh, that would be me. So I went down to the Gulf, thought I was only gonna stay a month, I ended up staying a full year. So I carried that story, and then I also um, diverted uh, in August of 2011, after a year in the Gulf, to Michigan. So, when I think tankers now, <clears throat> these are some of the things that run through my mind, because before the Trans-Alaska um, Trans Pipeline System was built, and the tankers started flowing, there was a series of promises, and this is sort of the phase you're in now, you know, the actively courting, the wooing, Oh, it will be great, there'll be all these jobs, and we'll have the safest pipeline, the safest tankers in the world, trust us. Um, <clears throat> State-of-the-art vessel traffic control system, all these promises never got written on into law, and they evaporated the minute that the Authorization Act for the, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was passed. They completely went away. Don't worry, not one drop of oil will be spilled in Prince William Sound. This is my second book on the Exxon Valdez oil spill, not one drop. Um, this is on the emotional trauma, uh, what breaks in a community when you go through something like this and how you heal it. Um, not one drop of oil will be spilled. These oil guys always talk, they do a double speak kind of a thing. Not one drop will be spilled, but if there is a spill, don't worry. We have the, whoops, we have the best equipment, um, materials, expertise for oil spill cleanup. Don't worry, we can clean it up. So there won't be a spill, there is one, don't worry, we can clean it up. Well, so, <clears throat> Exxon Valdez, of course, um, hit, and we discovered that the state of the art were these very archaic booms um, burning and dispersants, which are chemicals that are sprayed on the oil, supposed to be only in deep water, to break up the oil on the surface to have it pushed into the water column, where it turns out it's toxic to everything in the water column. So, um, that's Alaska. It's a little hard to see, but this little black streak here, that's actually water. Everything else is oil. Um, and this is the Louisiana. 21 years later, the exact same state-of-the-art equipment was broke out, uh, broken out for Louisiana. Booms burning and dispersants. And the booms, it's maybe a little hard to see down here, but are working exactly opposite of how they're supposed to. The oil is actually washed under the boom and over the boom so that the boom is now trapping the oil on the beach instead of protecting the sensitive shoreline from the oil. Um, so, um, <clears throat> not so impressive. Um, or the water in there. Basically, there, there is no way to clean these things up. This is 17 years after Exxon Valdez. Take the high school students out. Dig a pit about this deep, pour it under the seawater, and the oil flows into the pit. That's 17 years. That's with these talking rocks. That's why it passed these around. But the oil is, I don't want to give the impression that all of our beaches look like this, but the areas that were most heavily oiled, the bays, uh, where the fishermen were actually scooping buckets of oil out. Um, the uh, scientists are saying, we don't know, 50 years, we don't know how long it will take for this to break down. So, when I think tankers now, I think sick wildlife, I think ecosystem collapse. What happened in Prince William Sound was, um, the scientists uh, said, don't worry, there will only be short-term harm. And I had just gone through the schooling and we were on the cusp of understanding that oil might actually cause long-term harm. Um, because the, the methodology to understand cell membranes and everything was, was better. We could look inside a body. Um, what happened was the fishermen said, hmm, here's all this oil on these beaches where the pink salmon spawn, where the herring spawn. We're going to wait and see if the eggs of these fish survive, 
if the baby embryos and juveniles that grow up survive to become adults, if those adults can then reproduce viable offspring. So it's going to be a good four years or so before we can say all's clear or not. So pink salmon, of course, are two-year life cycle fish. Two years into the Exxon Valdez oil spill, the pink salmon runs collapse. Okay, um, and the next year they had collapsed as well because they're odd and even year uh, genetic stocks. Four years in, the herring stocks collapsed, and what had happened was the fish biologists only measured the adults that showed back up, and they used a in their little models. They used a constant mortality rate. So here are all these fish in Exxon Valdez. It turns out 99.9% .9 of them die. It takes one part per trillion to kill a herring egg. Okay? So the fish and game biologists were all modeling, you know, much higher survival rate. And by the time these babies should have become adults four years later, there was nothing there. So the, st the collapse actually happened in 1989 ecosystem-wise, but it wasn't until we were fishing four years later that we realized, uh-oh. And so the herring fishery is still to this day closed indefinitely until stocks recover. The herring fishermen who held $300,000 fishing permits and have to pay annually on that, um, those loans that they from the state banks um, their permits are worth zero dollars and they're having to take other fisheries money to pay on a permit that's worth nothing. Right? They might not ever be able to fish it again. So, I mean, these are jobs that were lost. Now, it also turns out that the herring are one of the basic forage fish of the Prince William Sound ecosystem. So, when the herring went down, there was a cascading effect across the, the whole ecosystem. So there's two <coughs> ways that there's a problem. One is that oil that you saw, where we actively dug the pit, it's all there. And every time there's a high tide, it comes in and it lifts that oil up to the surface where the barnacles and the periwinkles and the mussels all soak it up, the shellfish all soak it up. And then it gets transferred, this contaminated seafood gets transferred to the birds that eat this. And the, you know, the oyster catch, the fish gill moths, whatever, the sea otters. Um, but oil also kills the fish eggs and embryos that are uh, washed with this flush of, of hydrocarbons. Um, it's skeletal deformities, the upper one's normal, the lower one, you see there's the uh, problems with metabolism, with skeletal growth. Um, and then it also, um, if there's no herring to eat, then other um, 40 species of birds and mammals start to have effects, right? Like the black-legged kittiwakes, their populations crash well after the Exxon Valdez oil spill when the herring collapsed. Um, river otters, it turns out that um, the river otters uh, were not able to catch their fast swimming fish and the scientists said, what's going on here? And this is in part what we learned is that these ultra-fine particles, the black stuff that stays on the beaches, actually gets pulled into our bodies, so birds, fish, mammals, us, and it jams cell function. So it jams immune um, uh, system. It jams reproductive function. It's an endocrine disruptor. It jams synthesis, in the case of the river otters, the synthesis of the enzyme, the respiratory pigment enzyme, that holds oxygen in the blood. So the little river otters were breathing, but there was no oxygen that was binding in their blood, and they couldn't swim fast and catch the fish. They were eating like starfish and things that held still. Um, and then with the uh, killer whales, the orcas, um, they're a matriarchal society, the um, resident pods. And when too many adult <coughs> females died after the Exxon Valdez oil spill, the social structure, sort of like the elephants in Africa, you know, it just fell apart. The young didn't, didn't know. And so entire pods of orcas disbanded and went and reformed, joined other pods. It was, you know, the scientists said they've just never seen anything like this. So what are we seeing now in the Gulf of Mexico? It's been two years. Um, so here's what's going on. It's, it's positively uh, gross. Um, where the oil was spilled, fishermen are hauling up shrimp 
that have no eyes and no eye sockets. They have young on their heads. They have tumors inside and outside their body. The fish have uh, lesions that don't start on the outside. They start in the gut and they burn. It's a tarry substance and that burns its way out. Uh, when I showed this, this a picture in Grand Isle, to, uh, I spoke at the high school on the two-year memorial. And one of the um, young boys, um, young men, he was 17, said, oh, we've caught fish like that, only they look worse. I'm like, oh, great. Um, and the dolphins are coming in, high numbers of deaths. And there are no eyes and no eye sockets in that dolphin either. Something has gone terribly wrong in the Gulf. The dolphin are miscarrying at a rate of six times the, the norm, the average. Um, and I've been to spills in Spain and France and South Korea and, of course, Alaska and in the Gulf. And I have never seen what's happening in the Gulf. And I think it's because of the addition of dispersants, which was this wide-scale experiment. I mean, I think dispersants don't behave the same in the lab in controlled conditions as they do when they're unleashed on the environment. And I said that two years ago, and now the studies are starting to show that uh, that, might, that might have been right. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that, because the dispersants actually acted as an oil delivery system bound with the oil so tight that it pulled across skin barriers and pulled the oil into bodies. And dispersants target, I said I would get to this in a minute, dispersants target the same uh, organs as oil, so it's like a double whammy. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so we are beginning to see in the Gulf what uh, could become an ecosystem collapse. I mean, we'll see. Um,